Thank you. Thanks. She's such a strong woman. When I kissed her, there was feedback off her head. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome. You wanted me to come up first, and I kept saying, no, I want to make clear that I'm perfectly aware who the applause is for here. In it's my for own. you also. You, oh, you look like you already have a HarperCollins deal. You're going to be a best-selling author. Well, that would be nice. I mean, well, now that he said it, right? <laughs> from my mouth, Baruch Hashem. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Speaking of Baruch Hashem, I have hidden a lulav somewhere in this room. Can you believe how Jewish he is? I had no idea until I read the book. He talks about two zuzim on one of the first pages. So you have, you have a thing that you do, right, to tell, test how many Jewish people are in the audience? There are a couple different things. One of them is I say that I have hidden a matzah. There's $10. Mm. And then some people respond and look for the money. And then uh, the other thing, uh, how did you know I do this? Is it was an ins Oh, I told you. Uh, yeah, maybe I did. No, I, I didn't. Saw, I saw you do it. No, no, I saw you do it in another one. This is how. Oh, you did. Mm -hmm. This is how you find out how many Jewish people are in your audience. For who at I don't know I hum for rock. It's a lot of Jews. No coupons. No coupons. <laughs> Please read responsibly. So what's this, what, what is this like for you? So, you know. Being a Jew, well. Being a Jew, yeah, start from the beginning. Start from the beginning, mom. <laughs> Woody Allen, you know, pretty much set the palette. Mm. So 15 you, years of divorce, all the normal stuff. You're, but you're, you're here as you. You're not here as a character. You're not here to do stand-up, although we're going to get some of that, I'm sure. But what's it like for you to go around the country now and face audiences and be like, this is the real me? It's uh, really nice. I feel, especially in a place like this, I mean, mm -hmm. this is a JCC, so I feel like I'm kind of, I was one of the heavier set kids under the basketball of Melvin that they were knocking down, that they had to run to the locker room. So something in this room metaphorically happened to me. Um, <laughs> Melvin is here. <laughs> I, I feel like it's extended family. I do have my cousin uh, Karen is here. My uncle, my oh, uncles yeah? are in the book, and, and it goes through how they all passed on too soon because the book is about death and, about and comedy and um, my lower regions, which is inappropriate. <laughs> but it just tries to add some levity to the hardness, difficulty that we went through. Mm -hmm. So Karen is here, and, and uh, Karen Saget Gutman. And uh, if you have Saget as your last name, you mm -hmm. want to hyphenate. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah. this is a, an honor to be doing this. Awesome. It, it started in April, and, mm -hmm. um, and the book then became a bestseller. I don't know who they paid off or how they did it. And it just came out on paperback two days ago. Yeah. So, and I can, I'm actually having it because the gastroenter, gastroenterology. Here it comes. Gastroenterology, but good. Gastroenterology? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that, because they're sponsoring it, it's coming out in suppository form. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and it's also going to be uh, on microfiche. Oh, so Michael, you, please. Yes, yeah, so you could put it in like a booger and just you keep just it. Walk. And you could take it out and read it yeah. on the subway or whatever. Fortunately, the organizers have a, a big bright neon orange flag they're going to start waving if we ever go too far. <laughs> I, I don't uh, go any further. So, That's about it. Okay, so you know, we all know and are experiencing right now, like, and there's someone you've only seen on television or in movies, and all of a sudden you see them in person, it's so weird for a second, it's like, oh my lord, this person can physically look back at me. So I want you to tell the story, before we dig into the depths of your soul in the book, tell the story of when you met Jimmy Stewart, because that shows you on the other side of what people are experiencing. Me and who? When you met Jimmy Stewart. Oh, when I met Jimmy Stewart. Yeah. That's a funny story. Nobody asked me that. That's fascinating. I told you it'd be different today. Um, we have this thing already. We look like we could be relatives. We did not plan the outfits. I no. swear we didn't plan we look at We could be anyway. I know. I kind of felt that way. We were DMing on Twitter today. I was like, I think he's my much, much older brother. Yeah. If they ever start profiling, we need to move to different ends of the country. <laughs> Uh, oh, wait, we are at different ends of the country. Yeah, remember? Okay, right. so... Uh, Jimmy Stewart. I was on The Tonight Show, uh, not that I remember exactly, 13 times with Johnny Carson. <laughs> and the first time was with Gary Shandling, and then I was on with Johnny. And then uh, one time with Jay Leno, and then a lot of Johnnies. And so I was bumped from The Tonight Show, which meant they had an overabundance of guests. They had Roddy McDowell, who had been shooting a picture book, of Johnny and um, I was backstage getting all excited because I was gonna go on the show and uh, it was uh, Roddy McDowell, Jimmy Stewart, uh, obviously Mr. Stewart was gonna go first and then a music act which I still to this day don't know who it was because I for the purposes of Dirty Daddy I wanted to research this memoir part of my uh, Tonight Show experience so I even called Peter LaSalle who really was the producer who now runs Craig Ferguson's show till that's almost complete 
I get to then answer to a question seven minutes. Oh, after I, try, the I know, I know this is coming. That's good. So I go to meet Jimmy Stewart, and now right before I meet him, one of the producers tells me that I've been bumped from the show. So now I'm, I'm going. I'm just going to go home. He says, "Do you don't want to meet Jimmy Stewart?" I said. Okay, I'll meet Jimmy Stewart. There's no time for me on the show. I go up to Jimmy Stewart. He's in makeup. He's got uh, tissues coming out of his neck to protect his neck, mm -hmm. the shirts from the makeup on the neck. And I, he goes, this is a young comedian, Bob Saget, sir. Uh, and, I, and he goes, oh, hi, nice to meet you. And I'm just, that was that moment. You know, I'm just thinking it's a wonderful life. Mr. Smith goes to Washington. I'm just having that inner non-sexual mental <laughs> Orgasm, I guess, for, <laughs> with no physical uh, whatsoever intention, but it's Jimmy Stewart, and I'm drooling. I'm Pavlov's dog. My guts are, are drooling. So you're just standing there agape, right? Like you can't I am, talk. I am agape, and I'm staring, and I, and I stare too long, which anyone of, of note perceives that they're being looked at too long. And he said, sorry, okay, well, nice to meet you. And then I leave, and I walk out of the room. as creepy as you can walk out of a room for an old man that's just trying to sit there that I'm in awe of. And then I'm leaving, and I got my garment bag, and then Peter LaSalle comes over, the other main producer. Freddie DeCordova was his senior producer. And Peter LaSalle says, I'm sorry about this. We're going to make it up to you. You're going to have two segments next time. It's all going to be good. I'll tell you what, to make you feel good, would you like to meet Jimmy Stewart? <laughs> and I said, well, sure. <laughs> I didn't even say, now, the, nowadays, you ask me a question, I answer the truth right away before I can even disappoint. And uh, I said, I did not tell him that I'd met him before. So now... And it had been minutes, it had only been like 10 minutes. Right? This like, is about 15, 15 now. Uh, I'd gotten all my little things together, my loser <laughs> carrying bag. And that says loser on it. You oh, know. And, when you get I, kicked off the show. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And then I, I, I go backstage. Now Jimmy Stewart is loaded up, ready to go on to The Tonight Show, but it's in the dark. It's a black flat sitting there, and he's in a director's chair. He's got the tissues coming out of his neck, and he's in the dark. Just one light is shining over him so he can work on his poem, because he would read these poems that were so amazing. Mm. And he's, his hands are shaking. He was an elderly man. And all of a sudden, this voice breaks through uh, of Peter LaSalle. Uh, Jimmy, this young comedian got bumped from the show tonight, uh, Bob Saget. He really wanted to meet you. Um, and he looks at me and he goes, ah, didn't I just meet you before? I go, yes, you did, sir, but uh, I like you so much, I just wanted to meet you again. And he went, ah, uh, okay. Well, good luck to you. <laughs> and then I started, I walked away kind of quicker, and uh, he just like stared at me as I was leaving like I was really something wrong with me. He looked at me like I, I wasn't healthy. I love it. And then I, I got out of there. Yeah. If they would have asked me if I wanted to meet him once more. <laughs> oh, yeah. If Johnny would have said, I feel bad, you want to meet uh, Jimmy Stewart? I would have. I would have said yes. Yeah, you would have been over there. I would have, I would have, but nobody. I, I hit the road. But then I came back, and uh, they had me do a video about what it was like to get bumped, and that was my thing that I showed Johnny of how I got bumped. Oh, yeah? It's not worth describing. Okay. The Jimmy Stewart story, story is. Yeah, I love that. But they, they, Thank then you for bringing like, that up. Later on, <laughs> later on, when they're getting you to sign, you know, if they're a little uncomfortable because of your you know, fame. My incredible stature. Yeah, they can remember that you've been there on the other side. Um, I but, have more than once uh, met someone that mm -hmm. I think soiled my pants. I'm not sure. I'm not saying I did. I'm saying they were so gross that they soiled my pants. You're just a very nice bunch of people. <laughs> That's what that You're is. You're also working on the image still, trying to figure out how that happens. Yeah, it is very hard to do that. Um, well, you know, so I read every word of the book, and I love it. It's so fascinating. Thank you. Yeah. I cannot wait to read your book now. Thank and it's you. not just uh, there is no guilt, there is no shame, because this is a million dollars worth of therapy to be able to get to that moment as a Jewish young man. <laughs> no guilt, no shame. I, will, I look forward to reading it. Because well, the moment I met you, we started. I'm not going to tell them what we said. Okay. But we followed each other on Twitter yeah. as as. Uh, media uh, savvy Jewish people mm -hmm. do okay. and uh, we started to direct message each other yes. and we were discussing this and you came up with some very clever ideas which we can't share with yes. the audience but they involved uh, what we wouldn't be wearing today. Okay, fair enough, yeah. yeah. But you'll understand, you would understand, yourself, whatever. You're all going to buy the book and read the book and then you'll understand it involves something Jim Carrey once did. Let's just and then maybe 
The, actually, it is, what Jim Carrey did is in this book. It's in Dirty Daddy. I know. Oh, you That's really, why I suggested... Okay, well, now we lost them because they haven't read Jim it. Jim Carrey, uh, I was doing... You can oh, tell, I can that tell them. Yeah, tell that way. I was, uh, it was a comedy store, 15th or 20th, I might be wrong, year anniversary of the comedy store, and I was suffering there for like 10 years, just hosting while everybody would all go off and do shows, and I just kept uh, this scrubbing along mm -hmm. and uh, working for nothing. And then Jim Carrey was standing next to me uh, at the end of the special. He came out naked with a uh, sock over his, uh, his uh, schmeckle, as we say here <laughs> at the JCC. And I was angry because it stayed on. <laughs> I was kind of furious. And then I said, double stick tape. And he went, I felt a little better. Mm. Uh, and then they thought that I was going to pull it off, and I went, but I'm, I'm not that guy. I say those things, but I don't act on them. So that's, uh, it was a very long credit sequence to sit through. And uh, so we talked today about yeah, so how, perhaps uh, like that's that how happen. you were going to come out today. Yeah, exactly. Today. Nothing and like you, that. You, you, did, you did frighten me a yeah. bit. Yeah, because he didn't realize I had read the book. He thought I just came up with that idea on my own. All right, let's move on. I'm so, just impressed you read. <laughs> so, so we're going to dig down into the depths of your soul now. You ready All right. You know what I think we're going to find there based on the book? Penis Pe jokes. There are penis jokes yeah. in this book. Do me a favor. Um, I, I want everyone to understand, <laughs> this is actually a serious book. And you talk about... It is about a sad book, actually. It is how we yeah. dealt with death in my family. And I think it's something that speaks to everyone. And it, it's also something that speaks especially to Jewish audiences. Because in a lot of ways, we are... Uh, Jews are very... Uh, involved in comedy, and a lot of people say that's because Jews have been through a lot of pain, and, and historically. And, Were you and, up for and, reading and, a little and, section and, here? I'm sorry? Could you read a little section? Are you okay with that? Uh, anything you want to do. Awesome. I totally All trust right. you. So I want everyone to understand the kind of Oh, don't of read that. Is. No, what? I'm just kidding. <laughs> so um, start right there, and just go through Me there. Me read okay? it? Yeah, I want you to read oh, it. Oh, boy. Read to us from your book, Bob. All the way to here? Yeah, just from there to there. It won't take too long. Forgive me, everybody. This it was late will, at night. This will help you understand uh, the power of this book. It was either very late at night or at five in the morning. In my career, I've had the fortune of being able to work continually in radically diverse creative worlds. By day, I've done some of the most family-friendly TV imaginable. Then often, in the same day, I've gone on stage in the LA comedy clubs and whirled off with an adolescent's delight about my grandma's projectile diarrhea. <laughs> that in itself could, by many psychiatrist standards, be a bit of a call for help. I never do it to shock anyone, even though people have sometimes thought of me as a shock comic. If, if it is a through line or a constant, if it is a th that's badly written, if there is a through line. <laughs> I understood it. Harper Collins, nobody caught this. If it is a through line or a constant to what I do, it's not something I'm proud of, but I'm not ashamed of it either. It's more of a handicap, or depending on your perspective, a gift. It's what I used to think of as my mania. Now I've come to embrace it. You have to love yourself, but not in a movie theater because they will tabloid your ass. <laughs> Mostly, I've just always done what I found funny, strange as it may seem. Immature taboo humor, good immature taboo humor, always made me laugh. I love all kinds of humor, but my love of sick silliness started with my dad, whom you'll hear a lot more about, and his constant dick jokes. He was a grown-up who said things a nine-year-old like me always wanted to say because I was told not to. Joking has been a means for me to avoid pain. I've lost a lot of people. And throughout my childhood, almost every two years, someone in my family died at an unnaturally young age. The more tragedy befell us, the more odd gallows humor I would release. My humor, especially once I started doing it professionally, was always dark and twisted. Like your penis if you accidentally slammed it in the door of a car. <laughs> This is what happens. He goes down these emotional depths, and then he releases This book the is about how that humor helped me survive. Yeah. This is what's so great about it. I mean, you're opening up. You, this is the real Bob Thank Saget. You. Well, you couldn't talk like that. Thank you. You couldn't talk like that on a family show. I was doing a character. Right. I got a job. I was lucky to do it. Uh, if you play a character that's a clean-cut guy uh, that dust busts, and hugs people, you play that. Mm. Uh, and if you host a blooper show seven to eight at night, on family church night for most of the world mm. in English speaking, uh, you can't be doing weird humor yeah. either, not even weird. So uh, the weird thing that happened for the 20 years that followed those two shows, I directed for about four years. Okay. I stopped wanting to be in front of the camera and I did stand up some. 
But the weird thing is that people thought that I was, why aren't you acting like Danny Tanner? <laughs> like, the, the, the joke of equality that I had was, do you think Anthony Hopkins, who played Hannibal Lecter, actually eats people? <laughs> It's an, it's an acting part, and I was on Conan one night, and Conan said, no, Anthony Hopkins does eat people. We, <laughs> we had him on, he was just finished from eating someone. So that's just, it was right. a part that I played in a, a job I was lucky to get. Yeah, but I mean, you're choosing this time of your life to come forward and say, this is the real me, and that's what this book is. This is, this is the story of you in a lot of ways, and, and how comedy is so important to you. You know, when I was reading it, I, and we'll dig into this, but I realized, like, probably halfway through, how awesome it is that comedy has been your way of processing pain because in your universe and these are some of your idols that dealt with this the way to process pain is to drink a lot and to do really dangerous drugs and die young or too young yeah. and yet for you those things were never the attraction those things were never the answer for you the pain that you went through and we'll piece through this it's it's the relief comes in comedy which is a healthy way to process it it's the nicer way to, I, I did go, th the other devils did cross my life. Um, my uh, wonderful cousin Karen is here and she and I, uh, my dad lived to 89, but um, her father lived to about 80, I think, or 82. But all of our other uncles died around 37, 38, 40, heart attacks, um, all smokers, a lot of stress. Our grandfather, uh, I believe liver cancer from drinking, a lot of, People deal very hard with the depression that happened for my father's life and then just trying to have a successful job in the supermarket business, which is always the business you want to get into if you're looking to get rich. <laughs> Wait, your dad um, invented wrapping meat? Apparently. Or? I don't know. Our Uncle Jonah claims that my dad invented self-service meats, which means it's just impossible. If he invented <laughs> self-service meats, we would have had a billion dollars. <laughs> <laughs> it, he wrote a pamphlet on it because mm -hmm. some other guy invented self-service meats and I'll bet you anything he was not Jewish. <laughs> he was a Rockefeller already, <laughs> so he just got some more. You take meat, you put it in a tray, at that time cardboard, not right. styrofoam, and you wrap it and you put it on the burner. Ah, the uh -huh. burner. And that's what heats the plastic to it. And that's how you make your self-service <laughs> meats, <laughs> which I think my dad had a little something to do with. Well, <laughs> but when you were a kid. Your father created the light bulb. No, he plugged a lamp in once. <laughs> but I loved him very much. <laughs> It sounds like your dad was awesome. So, um, you know, you mentioned some of the stuff in passing, but let's just process through it. So you, um, you have had a lot of loss, everyone does, but you especially. So when you were born, you came t a year, two years to the date after your parents had lost twins, or yeah. you know, after the twins were born and then they died, right? You know more about me than I do. Well, yeah, I paid attention to your book. You had trouble <laughs> reading it just now. <laughs> I've never met a woman listen to me this much. <laughs> I know, he writes about that too. What are you doing tomorrow night? <laughs> this I don't is know, how that's it starts. My wife. Maybe we can come Want to go to Stone Mountain? <laughs> Don't, no, that's not the place to do that. I'll, I'll fill you in on the geography later. Oh, okay. You meant to say Piedmont Park or something. You like so, gladiator movies? <laughs> <laughs> you ever seen a grown man naked? <laughs> that's from Airplane. One. Um, oh, man. Well, the so thing that's, yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting because even when my mother was reading the book, and my, we lost mm -hmm. my mom in... Um, the horrible joke I did the other night, which she would, I think, almost appreciate, was uh, we just buried my mother. Oh, she's alive. <laughs> That's how many people laughed. Um, I don't think she'd like that. But she, she, she died she, while you were writing the book, right? She what? died while I was uh, just it came out. getting it published, mm -hmm. actually. And I had about two weeks to play with it. And I could have made her past tense, but we made a major decision to keep her present tense and do an homage to her at the end of it, an epitaph. Mm -hmm. And uh, she started to read half of it, and then she stopped at a chapter that was called uh, Things I Shouldn't Have Done, which brings up the drinking and driving and being out as a single man. I've been divorced for 15 years. Uh, it's funny, my ex-wife read the book. She hadn't finished it yet and called me and said, Bob, if I'd have known that you were doing all this drinking and driving, you wouldn't have had the girls every week. And I said, but look, this was 
they weren't with me for like a couple of weeks. It was, and I drank and drove. So yeah. that's yeah, it. That. And that she said, well, I, I don't know what to say. So well, finish the book. And then she finished it. And uh, then the next chapter is called Relationships I'd Rather Not Talk About. <laughs> <laughs> my mother decided not to read that one also. Uh, my mother actually prolonged her life two more weeks by not finishing the book. <laughs> She did. It was miraculous. So you don't know how she's pulling through. She stopped reading the book. A, it'll save a lot of people's lives. And By the way, just to put a, like, a halo over your head when you mentioned the drunk driving thing, he now, you wrote, you now call the police if you see someone like, I'm Ventura Boulevard. Weaving, I'm so right? messed up. Yeah. I, so um, you are I, I had a limo not drunk driving. You're like the guy watching out for the drunk driver. I've become a hall monitor. Yeah. And I, I had a limo driver uh, pick me up not long ago in Florida, and he was drunk, and I just wouldn't tolerate it, and I drove the limo and threw him in the back seat. Um, <laughs> And I drove the limo like six hours. It was through the panhandle, which is very painful. And he's in the back going, I don't know why you got to do this. And then he's looking for ice is in the back Is any part seat. of the story true? That's a true story. Really? Yeah. Once in a while I couldn't tell in the book. Like, did your father really put an eggplant in your bed dressed in a babushka? <laughs> my dad, uh, <laughs> my dad, I was out dating uh, with the lovely girl that was my girlfriend, who then became my wife, who then became my ex-wife, who now is my bestie. Um, <laughs> but back then, I was uh, 17, and I was dating her, and we were living in Philly. And uh, I came home late from a date, and he and my mom had gone to bed. And uh, at least I think that's what they were doing. I don't know. Uh, that's gross. But uh, <laughs> yeah, it's even upsetting now. Nah, no. yeah. So I walked into my bedroom, and under the blanket was an eggplant with the covers up to here on it, like it was a head with a towel around it, like a babushka, and a note that said, Bob, I waited up for you. An eggplant with an a face on a bush. An eggplant. And I just looked at it and I just thought to myself, your dad's nuts. <laughs> and then I said, why'd you do that? He said, did what? You know, just crazy. But he did it to just be off and add humor at times that, I mean, we had a, we had a cousin, uh, Karen will appreciate this because she's here. We had a cousin, Tootsie. Her name was Tootsie and she was lovely and she had a rough life. She had had polio. And so... It was a compounded funeral. It was a sad funeral. She was a lovely person. It was in Washington, D.C. I was with my sisters and my dad. And as they're lowering her into the ground, my dad starts singing quietly so I can hear, so my sisters can hear, toot, toot, tootsie, goodbye. You know. Al Jolson, he was a big Al Jolson oh, fan. I just don't think you sing at a funeral. So, you're talking about your relatives, and we'll get back to like your life story. Um, would you please tell the story about Aunt Becky, who snored, <laughs> and how you handled that? We gotta be related. Is there a way to fill out papers that we can be cousins <laughs> after this? Uh, Tootsie's, actually, Becky lived with Tootsie. There you go. There you go. In Washington, D.C., in a beautiful apartment. And uh, I was watching The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. You were a kid. You were I was kid. nine. Oh, yeah. And I remember lighting a sparkler, and I was bringing in the new year, watching Johnny Carson, whose show was 90 minutes at the time. And then it was time to go to bed, because they told me I could just watch Johnny and then go to bed. And I went to bed, and Aunt uh, Becky always seemed 80. I think she was 80 for like one of those relatives that seems 80 for 40 years. <laughs> and she was really low to ground, almost like very low to ground, like Yoda or something. I don't know. <laughs> tiny, tiny little Aunt Becky. And so she got into bed. She was already asleep. And I got into bed next to her. Not next to her. I was sorry. Okay, so I had my way with Aunt Becky and <laughs> got some of that Aunt Becky. No, what happened was, um, that's not nice no, at all. That's, no. That's we kept an abacus over her bed so we could keep count of how many times <laughs> I visited her. But I had a... I had a single bed nowhere near her. Hello, would never touch Aunt Becky. May she rest in peace. Um, so she snores. She snores yeah. terrible. Still, I can hear her snoring. That's, uh, <laughs> After afterlife. she left, people go, what's that sound? Uh, <laughs> and she, I couldn't bear the snoring. So I took, um, the only thing I could find was my ski mask. Um, because that was, <laughs> these kids are smart. And I put a ski mask over my head. 
and I could still hear it through it. So I take tissues and I ball them up and I put them in my ears under the ski mask. So now it's like an onk. It's got like I've got giant ears. Uh, and now she's uh, asleep and then she, she makes one of those snores that a person makes right before they wake up. You know, it's like a whole sea manatee just flipped over. And, and she looks at me and she sees this guy with a ski mask and giant alien onk ears, and she screams ah, at the top of her lungs. And then I go, no, no, it's me. And I start to take this off, and I thought she was going to have a heart attack. She screams even more. That three seconds of just trying to get this off, and then tissues are flying out. It's like, I don't know, Gallagher comes to kill you. I don't know. And so, uh, anyway, Carrot Top. I love it. The murderer. So uh, I'm there, and she goes, Bobby, why'd you do that? And I said, well... You were snoring, and uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know how I got out of it. All I know is that she didn't sleep well that night. Well, uh, <laughs> so, um, all right, so let's just uh, drill down this so people understand. Uh, so you, there were, there were twins that died before you were born, and then when you were growing up, all of your dad's younger brothers died between the ages of 37 and 41 from Yeah, 42. Times. It was like, uh, yeah. Uncle Ozzy was chasing kids, stealing his tire, and so he was, he was upset. Mm. So he had a heart attack. And then Uncle Sammy was on the tennis court. He was the youngest. He was 37. And the book I say that God just said, oh, I like that guy. Mm. Bring him. You know, let's go. Mm. And Uncle Manny, um, he had a wife, Millie, who we didn't lose till a few years ago. She was a very tenacious uh, person. And he was smoking like six packs of cigarettes a day. And I think she, uh, she ate his heart out, I think. <laughs> and, uh, and he had a front and a back heart attack. I don't know what that means, because, wow. you know, I'm a doctor. Right. He had a front and a back heart attack. Now that we're sponsored by the Sounds gastrointestinal. Efficient. That's how I'm getting <laughs> they my, can next, explain. my next heart procedure is going right through my butt. Because mm. I'm planning to have a fart attack when I die. Oh, OK. Good for you. Uh, so yeah, so they're all gone. And then. Uh, more people died than they even put in the book. There, right. one of their daughters right. died of cancer, and then the big, tr the thing that you started to bring up earlier was that I was born, which is really weird and kind of metaphysical. I was born two years to the day that my parents had twins that were born, May 17th, two years exactly to the day that I was born, and the hospital in Philly had dysentery, yeah. so those two babies lost yeah. their lives. So they were named Robert and Faith. So my parents. And not to belabor it, because I don't want to, because it was a short part of the thing, but one sister died of a brain aneurysm, my sister Andy at right. 34, and my other sister Gay of scleroderma at 47. Yeah. So my par I don't blame you for leaving. So my, <laughs> my parents, Elijah just left. So my parents, uh, it was four, yeah. four two, that's, that kind of example of comedy right. deflection is how you and it's also narcissistic because a book is a narcissistic thing unless I'm talking about the world and I, I'm not as gifted as a John Stewart or as a Bill Maher to talk about how the world is. You don't talk about religion on first dates, so I talk about death and my testicles. <laughs> I try to keep it with things I know about. Actually, I wanted to make a word cloud from your book, but I couldn't download the whole thing. I wanted to see which word would come out bigger, testicles or, or death. I so think, I think uh, death's probably the bigger word, but I try to... Uh, cover it up like everything else with testicles. Mm. If, uh, even if I'm um, on a date and then she speaks of death, I try to stop it with my testicles. Right. He keeps looking at me like, <laughs> did I go too far? No, I'm, you're I'm good. asking you to help me. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm like, begging for you're help. You're good, you're good. This is a prisoner of war saying, get me out. <laughs> you're completely fine. But, but, but the, the, the key that I want to like, help them understand, and what you talk about in the book, and a lot of the book is about this, is that so you, your parents knew all this pain, and you growing up knew all this pain of loss, and you learned comedy really early on. You learned to joke to make life lighter and to make life better. And you say that your dad, like the section you read to us, your dad helped give you that. Your dad, but you also say that your dad was um, the kind of dad who, I think because of his, his physical condition, couldn't really play ball with you. And right. you think he wasn't really comfortable as just at the person who he was, raising a young boy, so he started treating you like a grown-up early on. So your dad, for all these reasons, because of the pain and because of who he was, instilled comedy in you really early on, and that led to you ultimately being here. Do I owe you $250? <laughs>
<laughs> That's very therapeutic. <laughs> okay, you know what? There were times reading the book that it was hard to not feel like I'm hearing you tell, like I'm listening to you tell your therapist on the couch, your life. yeah. Because I, you're acknowledging all this stuff. You're like, yeah, this is how my mind works. I, I start to go down this road and then I, I jump over here. Well, I'm trying to, and that's the advantage of what I'm lucky. I'm just uh, fortunate that being able to talk in my voice mm -hmm. and go off on tangents, and then I had an editor, Mark Chait, help me steer back so that it would at least be linear, mm -hmm. and chapters help. They have these things called chapters, mm -hmm. and they help separate it so you don't just go off on tangents about your butt and not come back. Or in this case, you do, which is something that HarperCollins do. doesn't always well, let everyone do, but they did let you well, do I had that. a physical ailment happening okay. because of writing the book the oh, whole time. That's right. And it started at the very beginning. Here it goes. was the uh, older school Mac uh, laptop, mm -hmm. Mac Pro, yeah. and uh, I wanted to write a book. And they say, you're going to write four hours a day? That's how you have to write a book. You get up and write a book. And I'm like a comedian, and I do other stuff, and I, and, but disciplined hours, is, it's a job, it's real work, it's ethic. So the laptop was uh, overheating a lot, and it was on my lap. And so I believed that I was ruining any possibility for my future, and that I could cause some kind of possible trauma mm -hmm. to my... Yes. testicles, to be honest with you. So this was, was a genuine concern of yours as you were writing, which I, is another was, reason you kept bringing them up. It was heated, heating them up, and at a okay. point, they were all I thought about. Right. So I'm in the middle of death, and then I can tell that they're arguing. And oh, that's right. They're having a fight with each they're other. They're having a fight with each other. Because one had it better than the other. Well, one's older than the other, because oh, right. one, yeah, one came out first. One they, you know, I came out on an angle. Like, you did a lot of research for this book. A lot of these asides. But... Oh, yeah. um, um, they can't all be gems as the other brilliance of them. <laughs> wait, wait, but help me out. So, but I did get a new laptop at the yeah. whole end of the whole book, but I but took the laptop it. back to the Apple Store while I was writing the book, and then I got this new Air Book, which was the plasma screen, and it was cool, and it weighed nothing, but I wasn't getting the same sensation. I'd lost, <laughs> I'd lost my you muse. I was feeling cool yeah. air down there. It had a fan. Mm -hmm. They were going like, hey, this is nice. Leave us like this. And I just, because uh, by the end of the process of writing a book, they were talking to me. Well, and um, then I just said no, and I, I went back and I returned, and I returned that, uh, that air book. Well, and I went back to my cooking dim sum warmer. Art comes from pain, so you needed pain the whole time in order to get the book done. I get it. So, um, so, all right, so you get this comedy. So you started as a comedian professionally, like, 17, 18, or early on, right? Yeah. Do you remember any of your earlier jokes, like the earliest jokes you did? Yes. Were they any good? I don't know. Some of them were just absurd. And I'd started in Philly uh, at a club, and I won a radio contest for WMMR for a song called Bondage. I was 17 years old singing a song called Bondage. Mm. Good, clean, fun, it's bondage for everyone. Masochists and sadists unite one and all. Bondage is the rage. Come on, let's have a ball. And I would take the train, exactly, everyone's response is correct. And, and I would, except for the people laughing, <laughs> and I would take the train to Catch a Rising Star on the improv, and I met Richard Belzer and Robert Wall and people mm. that would become my future agents. And, I was only 17, and then I started to write more comedy songs and then stand-up. So the stand -up, first stand-up I did was a joke that I ended up repeating, which was my mother said, when you grow up, not everybody is going to like you. And I said, I need names. <laughs> and, I, and that's in the book, and I, yeah. and I need a list. And I have them. I, you end up having them, you know. But then you realize <laughs> yeah, it you doesn't. Know, yeah. You know they are, but it doesn't matter at yeah. that point, because then you end up being friends with them anyway, or you work with them. Yeah. So, it's well, like, so speaking of that, so you have idols that you got to watch early on. Some of them became your friends. Who were your comedy idols, and, and what was so amazing about them? It's pretty amazing that I got, I was at the, the comedy store, which is, and the improv, and this place, the Laugh Factory, but not as much. And I used to come through here. What's the wonderful club here owned by Marshall uh, Childs? The, um, the Punchline? No, the, com the comedy Funny Farm? What's the one out in Roslyn? Roslyn, Roswell. Roswell Road has the Punchline, which is an A-list, like one of the top clubs. Well, it was, but it might have been a different name back then. What's it called? Someone yell it louder. We can't hear you. Funny, Funny Farm. Funny Farm, thank you. Yeah, it does sound like you need medication to go there, though. So it was the Funny Farm. If, so these places were 
blow that up times 50 because the comedy store, when I started in 1978, I mean, the MC, one of the MCs that brought me up was David Letterman mm -hmm. and, and Jay Leno and, and Michael Keaton I, I, and Billy Crystal. I would just sit with these guys and I was the young new boy there. And so I was pretty much awestruck. And it was a time in comedy that we haven't had since, no matter how. And we, now we have the greatness that is Louis C.K. on tour with his yeah. oddball tour, and all of my friends came through town here that, that are giant comedians, and Kevin Hart, and Chris Rock, and yada yada. But then it was, uh, Pryor was going on all the time. I was emceeing. I'd bring up Richard, and I'd bring up Eddie Murphy when he was working out raw. So, I mean, I was at the, you know, talk about getting your masters in whatever this crazy craft is, yeah. the lunacy that is stand-up and the art that it is and the actual amazing accomplishment that it can be. Not, I mean, I got, I got to witness greatness uh, more than yeah. most people. And I, and, I, and I did a Richard Pryor movie, Critical Condition, right. so I hung out with him in addition in an acting thing. And Ronnie Dangerfield became a good friend. Ronnie Dangerfield came Don into Rickles. the... Um, Comedy store in La Jolla. Robin Williams was working that weekend. The great Robin Williams, which is a big hit too. We were, he was a friend. It's uh, been a hard, bad year for uh, comedians. So uh, maybe next year will be a lot better, and only the unfunny ones will go. <laughs> um, but uh, I, Rodney was was there. Rodney walked into the comedy store and he said, "I don't know you, man, but I've seen you. I'm Merv Griffin show. You're funny. Uh, it's okay if I use an f-bomb, by the way." Uh, yes, we went over this, yes. Can I use one? That's allowed. All right, it's just Rodney. It's, he goes, uh, you got a fucked up Jew head, man. There's nothing you can do about it. He says, uh, your mind never stops. You, you, you got nothing you can do. You better, be, better to be born poor, not Jewish, and stupid. <laughs> so that was his first words of wisdom to me. <laughs> And then he told me to go like a tank. Just go like a tank. Everybody wants to stop you. Nobody wants you to make it. He, he equated doing stand-up to... And this is a guy who wasn't in Caddyshack till he was 59 years old. Right. So he had been doing a lot of stand-up, and he tried to help young comedians. And he was also, you know, a little nutty. And he, um, I became friends with him. And I uh, actually officiated his funeral, mm. which was... I mean, I was close with him. Yeah. And... Um, and then after he left, um, I, I, I always had a few comedian friends that are sacred to me that I, that I knew and loved, and Richard Pryor, I mean, it's like unbelievable that I knew him. Um, it's definable for me, one of the finest. Uh, and yet, yet this year, I love all comedians. I mean, Joan's death this year is horrific. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, David Brenner died this year, he was wonderful. Mm -hmm. You know, it, I knew him from Philadelphia. But um, the one that's alive, that if he comes here and plays, you have to go see him is Don Rickles. And he's, he's, you said like, he's like a new father to you. He is like a new father to me, except uh, he, he grabs me by the head when he doesn't see me and he whispers in my ear, I don't miss you at all. Oh, do the way that he summarizes your comedy with that little song. Oh, that's horrible. Did I no, put that you're in the, allowed I put the F the word, word though, so you can do that. Yeah. yeah, it does have the F word, yeah. Yeah, this is how he, he well, summarizes Well, it's the him. He, you know, he's all I watched. I watched him and Rodney, and they're two mm -hmm. totally different kind of acts. One's a Vegas act that was close friends with Sinatra and all the mm -hmm. Dean, and that was uh, Don. And then uh, Rodney was the guy that was, uh, you know, too cool for not really too cool, just an outsider and like the Bill Murray more of the world and, you know, those kind of guys. So, uh, but a lot of those guys from the Dean Martin days and Frank, they talked a very blue off stage. That was their way. They wouldn't do it as part of their work, but they would do it off stage mostly when they were just together, just trying to make mm -hmm. themselves laugh. So apparently recently, not long ago, like a year ago, uh, Don Rickles was explaining to Bob Newhart and Tim Conway what my act is like. And sometimes I sing songs that are comedic songs. <laughs> I have a song, and it's a country song, and audiences sing it with me. And you, you can Google it. It's not that offensive, really. It's called My Dog Licked My Balls. And it's a, <laughs> it's a country song. It's just late at night. I've had a drink. It's sad. There's nothing sexual about it. It's just a sad thing that accidentally happened. And then he, didn't, he, he doesn't live, because yeah, that's what happens. <laughs> you lick my balls, you die. <laughs> that's why I'm so alone. But, um, but, but Don Rickles, 
is in a group, and I've heard this from a couple people, and he's talking to Bob Newhart and Tim Conway, making up what he thinks my act is. And he says, he comes out, this is Don, me doing a bad impression of Don. He comes out like he's a Jewish Clark Kent. He looks like he's the nicest guy in the world. And, and then all of a sudden he starts singing, and the monkey fucked the dog, and the dog <laughs> fucked the monkey. And then he said, Bob Newhart goes, he says that? He, really, he does? And Tim goes, really? They all stutter and stare. So this is the way people think, okay, so people They're are They're funny as hell, by the way. They do mm. things to me that I would never do. Uh, uh, real quick, I'll just tell you what, a Tim, okay. Con what a Tim Conway did, and he's like 80. Uh -oh. I'm at a party uh, celebrating for Don and Barbara Rickles anniversary. Um, I'm trying to hug Don. He's on a chair to say goodnight to him. Tim Conway, if you don't know, he, uh, he did this thing called Dorf on Golf, where he was on the ground like a little person, but he just put his shoes over his knees, and he always falls backwards. It's just an old vaudeville trick, but it's very funny. because And he's from the Carol Burnett Show. He's a very well-known mm -hmm. guy, I'm, it's people that might know. But, he was on his knees in front of a, and here, here's Don's where you're sitting, and, and a woman is right here, a, a large woman, like a Margaret Dumont kind of woman, and just, well, Don, it's so nice to see you. And, and uh, Tim Conway is just on his knees staring into her butt. <laughs> and I'm right behind him, and he's just going like this, and then he's like opening a telescope. <laughs> And he's looking, and then he keeps looking up at me to make sure that I see it. I'm like, I'm like, could you stop? She's going to see you. I'm more worried about getting caught. And that to me is funnier than any, any blue joke in the world. Because it's not, it's not shock. It's just making silliness out of officious moments. That's what the Marx Brothers did. You know, that's yeah. what I, think you love I love. Them too. Um, dude, we've got to get to Full House. It's time. We got we got Well, so, I have to tell you, the full house was all a dream. Mm. <laughs> the last episode, right? Yeah, it was just you like Dallas. Up, was, so Danny how, wakes up and he's just drunk in biker gear. I can just Turns see. out Danny was Jesse the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> da -na -na. <laughs> What's that thing you did with John Stamos once where you, you like you guys were in, in, in a bathroom and there was another guy there and you made it seem like you like your characters are real? Oh that really happened, yeah. Um we were at a club in LA, the uh, Laugh Factory, and there was like a 17-year-old kid in there. And uh, John and I were just going to the bathroom, and uh, this kid's standing there, and he's like looking at both of us. He's like, well, wait a second, you know? And I go, hey, uh, and these are the characters' names from Full House. I go, uh, hey, Jesse, how's it going? He goes, oh, Danny, I'm having trouble, you know? N Nikki and Alex, they're not <laughs> sleeping. <laughs> I think Becky's mad at me. I said, well, you know, it's probably because of the ratings of Wake Up San Francisco. I've been having <laughs> real trouble. And Comet, I think someone's in Comet's diet, and it's not agreeing with them. And then all of a sudden, uh, I think I did mention, oh, and Steph drove a car through the living room. I'm upset about that. And the, the punchline was that this kid just, like, peed all over himself. <laughs> of he course just, he did. He was going, oh, my God, Full House is real. <laughs> it's real. <laughs> But how, does, how, how did you, Dirty Daddy, right, comedy guy, become the ultimate clean cut? Well, it was a character. Uh, yeah, no, I noticed. But like, how, why you? <laughs> it, was hard to, it was hard to do. But like, why, why would it I have been sometimes. you and that wasn't your comedy? It was kind of my, but it was my acting stuff that I'd done. When yeah. I was in this Richard Pryor movie, which was before called Critical Condition, I cursed a little bit in it. I was a Richard's go-to guy for, Garrett Morris mm. used to be on Saturday Night Live. I had to like squeeze his testicles because Richard wouldn't do any of the jobs a doctor would do. So I, he had me, Dr. Jaffe, do all the dirty stuff. But I was all, I was a straight person. I was, oh. I, I, I looked like, you're, if you turn the sound off on any of my specials, I look like I'm your dentist. <laughs> you know, you don't know what I'm saying. It's like, oh, what a likable young sort. Or I hate a guy that looks like that. Yeah, you said people. Does Anthony uh, Weiner have a comedy special? You know, you don't want. <laughs> But um, yeah, people say you look like Anthony Weiner, or you said uh, Bill Nye the Science Guy. Bill Nye the yeah. Science Guy. You hear all that stuff. The uh, biggest compliment is uh, Stephen Colbert, and he's he's yeah. about to take over, and I think he's going to be amazing, yeah. actually. But Stamos and I have become we're incredibly good friends. So is so is every everyone from the show. Or uh, it's unusual mm. that people and I 
I'd like to think I had, I do know I had something to do with it because I don't like to have disingenuous relationships right. in my life. Well, it's good to get rid of people from your life, not good, but if people hurt you or they're negative, it's nice to not necessarily correspond with them because you have to. Was it a stretch to play Danny Tanner, given that? Yeah, I, I, was, uh, I, was, I think I was unappreciative sometimes. I was actually getting an award. I was like getting Jew of the Year award in, uh, in oh Philadelphia God. from the Jewish exponent. Mm. And I was at this thing, but I had no time to get it because I was like really busy. I was doing both shows. Mm. And this writer, a very prominent writer, Gail Schister, always nice to me, always get a lot of articles. It probably played in the Jewish Journal or whatever is here. Is there a Jewish Journal here? Jewish Times. Jewish Times, because they syndicate those articles, you know, for our, for our chosen people. Mm -hmm. uh, but it said that, you know, he was the number one guy on the video show. But all she said to me when I was going to get my Jewish star of David, my big one with a plaque that said how I've contributed to Jewish values and everything, and the character could not be less Jewish. Right. I mean, they, Danny Tanner, they tried me to say grace on the show once, and I couldn't do it. I tried. They had John do it. I, I was really? La I was laughing. I couldn't help it. <laughs> I don't know why. I find, you know... Yeah, it's, it, it's funny. Serious moments, very uh, humorous. So uh, I just walked up past her, and she said something like, you must be incredibly frustrated being on Full House, being that you're the funny one, and you're the funniest person, but you're not funny at all on Full House. Uh, how does that make you feel? Uh, and that's right before I was getting the award. So that's how they do things to people to get them. And I said, well, yes, it can be frustrating sometimes, and that's the end of that. But, mm. you know, it's wonderful to be on a show like that. It didn't matter what I said mm. after that. So then the title of the article was Saget Frustrated by Full House. Well, because that's what they asked you. And it was 150 newspapers. So my producer, when I got back to L.A., my producer held it up and said, what is this? I said, I don't know. She talked to me. I was getting Jew of the Award. No. Jew um, of the on Year. On behalf of other journalists, I'm I was sorry that Jew was of, Jew of Award. Jew of Award. That's why I, I didn't deserve it. I can't speak. That uh, shouldn't be done to you. Um, so I was on the set of uh, Big Bang Theory, and it was so fascinating to, to watch an episode. Yeah. And, they run uh, that really well. Yeah, they do. I was sitting right behind Chuck Lorre. It was fascinating to see what he did. Mm -hmm. But I found it like half fascinating, but half incredibly boring, because like... I mean, I come from live TV, right? An hour show takes an hour to do. And then when you're doing a sitcom, they just keep changing and reshooting it. So they would like break for 40 minutes and then come back and then shoot it again with new lines. Anyway, the reason that I, I say this is I know you're wary of ever complaining like, oh, my job is so hard when you're on a sitcom because you're lucky to have it. True. That said, there were little kids on that show who had to go through that. It is a grueling experience on the day of the actual and shoot. For it's kids, like eight it's or nine impossible. hours. Yeah. yeah so how, how did they handle it as children to have to go through that experience and not go crazy? It's really hard because uh, also when Ashley and Mary Kay started the show, they were less than a year old. They yeah. were nine months old. So um, I, I, the joke is in the book. I actually, it's not my joke. It's Ashley's joke uh, that I, I changed her diaper. That was just two years ago. <laughs> That's her joke. But um, it's, it's very difficult. Sugar. They would do it. <laughs> do the scene. Here's a gummy bear. And I was like, wait a minute. I'm a dad. You can, and my daughter, my oldest daughter, is one year younger than mm -hmm. Ashley and Mary Kate mm -hmm. are. So, and that changed. That stayed the same all these years. She was always one year. <laughs> Amazing how that works. It's crazy. I know. But then I uh, said, we can't give these kids this anymore. We need to give them nut mix and, and grains and, and fruit. And they got diarrhea. Proving, and you're doing a big book about parenting. Yes. That was, you can't just do the flip side of, you know, no. sugar to raisins. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> right. But, but I, yeah. I was the youngest mentally behavioral member of the set. I was the one that they would say, Bob, upstairs. Yeah. And then everybody would have meetings because I was doing the best I could. I was the, it was done by the producers. It was uh, Bob Miller. Bob, sorry, Bob Boyette, Tom Miller, and Jeff Franklin, and Tom and Bob had done Happy Days of Vernon Shirley, um, and with Gary Marshall, another guy named Ed Milkus that weren't part of our show, and it had the same pattern of characters. So uh, Danny Tanner was basically Richie Cunningham. That's mm -hmm. basically what he was. The straight guy, family focuses around it. John, uh, Jesse was Fonzie, 
we came in and instead of hey it's like hey how's my hair you know <laughs> and Dave uh, Coulier Joey was either Ralph or Potsy we couldn't mm. tell and I think uh, Ashley and Mary Kate were Tom Bosley I, I don't know <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, there's a fam family family uh, formula that works, except ours had the Disney formula, which is an unhappy formula, actually, which is there's no mom. Right. And so that's the formula of most Disney movies. And uh, this, this show existed because of uh, Three Men and a Baby, because mm -hmm. that was the premise that did so well. Right. So they kind of snatched so, it. So, I mean, you write in the book that, like, you, you can look back and know that it's two dimensional, but also that people are, do come up to you and say you were like a father figure to them during yeah. the year, and you appreciate that, and that means something. I do, especially the ones that I date. So, oh. <laughs> After you do these college tours, then they come up to you. And it's, uh, this is, this is uh, funny, weird, not that bad a thing. I went to go see my friend Josh Radner's show. Josh is the star of How I Met Your mm -hmm. Mother. Now, I narrated his voice on the show 20, 30 years into the future. If, you, if it's not shown in an English-speaking televised world, I'm not on the show <laughs> as a voice. It's some guy that speaks Spanish, because I can barely talk Esperanto. <laughs> so, I can't speak restaurant French. <laughs> So, but Josh and I would go out and I would, we, he's single, I'm single, yeah. or, and we were walking over to girls and I'd say, which demo uh, are you interested in? <laughs> which Ted guy. Mosby would you like? <laughs> it's a very specific type of humor, but. Uh, but no, but so, so uh, just one more thing on Full House. So, oh, please. and I know that to this day you are close with the, like you hate when people say bad things about the Olsons. Or, yeah, I don't like it Because you, you much. still have this kind of parental relationship. Or, yeah, I just, I yeah. just saw them. You watch I'm, out for them. Yeah, they're my friends and they're real smart. Yeah. They're smarter than literally anybody that, that criticizes them. Their, their IQ is greater and yeah. They're more successful. Well, they're running a billion-dollar empire. And, well, they know they really have good taste in what they're doing. Yeah. But they're also really great people, mm. and they don't ever take slings back at anybody. Right. So they're just really—they've been through a lot, and they're very—and they're doing really well. So, so but I want to say something. And makes me happy that all the Candace has got three kids, almost one Dancing mm -hmm. with the Stars. So will there be a follow-up show? Will there be a like a, a new full house reunion? That's what yeah, everybody has to ask that. Well, You're doing it, good broadcasting now. that now. there is a TGIF love reunion of uh, the Girl Meets World. See, his yeah, show used to be thing. part of TGIF. So now that there's Girl Meets World, will there be like a full house the new era world, with like? Uh, is it Girl Meets World? It's now Girl Meets World. That's like the new one. Wow. But it's the same. They brought back the same characters. Yeah. So would, would that ever happen with Full House? With like I, it just TJ can. grown up with three kids? Well, they, would, they talked about that. They did mm -hmm. talk about That's what all the stuff was. I think it was kind of fan perpetuated. Because it? it's not Star Trek. You know, that's 10 years later. They brought everybody back. Right. And Scotty was still angry. So that worked. <laughs> but but we, I, I don't think, I mean, I asked them what they would do with me. And, oh, you'll be more of a caramudgeon. And you'll be, <laughs> oh, great. That's what I do. Disgruntled in <laughs> no, a chair with a broken dustbuster. No. <laughs> well, I would. You know what they did with the Brady Bunch is they put wigs on everybody and they made a high, you know, high styled right. comedy and it was successful. It was with Gary Cole and Shelley Long and and I I don't have any desire to come on to a set and go what's going on you know just no. like unless he had a drinking problem and we processed it on the show mm. but that wouldn't be for Nick at night you know. So, <laughs> so I realized something when, when I was reading the book, and, and we only have like a few minutes, so we get to Q&A. Oh, you, we can but, have more time. Well, let's nice keep going. People. Fine by me. I'm going to hand out latkes soon. <laughs> <laughs> so... It would be horrible if I had latkes in my yeah, pocket. Yeah, I was just wondering if like, you actually had... Because so you would do it. There would be someone in the, in the, in the kitchen You know there. the blotting a latke is an art form? And I know there's people here that know what I'm talking about. Oh, yeah. No, you have to blot them. You have to blot the well, latke. No, you lay a layer and then the thick paper towel and then the I'm actually layer. coming out with an invention and I'm going to sell it on the Sky Mall catalog. It's called the blotka. <laughs> and it, it's got two pieces of paper towel that you buy specifically for the blotka. Mm. They're just paper towel, but you don't make them yourself. They're... They fit it, and then you just blot. That is. And blotka. Nice. That's the new meat wrapping. Your and dad then we'll get so some proud. old footage of Andy Kaufman doing latka. Latka. <laughs> and then it'll be some <laughs> kind of comedy thing that people will think they have to get. You know, he compares comedy to jazz, to like scat, and, and that kind of is what it is, right? You just keep riffing, you see where it goes. But hold on, I have to tell you something. Yes, Before please. We You're go very okay. good at this. Don't thank you me. think he's going to be a major oh, yes. thing? He's going to be amazing. Thank you. No, seriously. Yeah, well, thank you. I appreciate it. Do you uh, deliver bad news? Do you go when you go on the CNN? Do you do the bad news stuff where you have to sometimes. show this 
car yeah. stuff that's going on? Sometimes, yeah, sure. I mean, that, that's part of journalism. You know, you have to deliver it, but then... And it's just getting worse and worse, right? What they want you to sell? What they want you to say to people? <laughs> Let's talk after, all right? <laughs> when I'm not mic'd. Um, no, I mean, we all know what's going on in the world, but this is about you, so okay. let's get back to this. So, Are you sure you'd rather talk about Full House than ISIS? Are you sure? Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. I'd almost gone an hour without thinking of them. So, listen, um, I was reading, so when I was reading the book, I realized, okay, yes, you, you joke about how it's two dimensional. It was two dimensional, I get it. But I, it made And it's me, meant for kids. It's good for it to yeah, be two dimensional. But it I mean, also it, made you can me watch realize, it for everybody can watch it. But. Okay, so I, I think it might have even been like have a, a, even a deeper success than maybe you even realize. So, my book is about how um, the man. modern fatherhood is essential to advancing gender equality, because the only way that women, for example, will be able to advance in the workplace is when men also have the choice of staying home and taking care of the children, and we have all these draconian policies that make it right now so the men can't stay home and so the women stay home, so that we're all one. So that it's, it's about You just how pissed somebody oh, off. I know. It's like, I'm so Some lady just no, took off me. and said, I don't want that quality. Try being a journalist. I pissed off so many people. But anyway, as part of this, so I'm, I, I've been It's also treating women with, res treating their mother with respect. Respect, totally. Whether they're together or not together mm -hmm. is also very important. Because so you have a big in them, job actually. ahead of you to yeah. make that known. That's a good press yeah. circuit for you to do too, because that yeah. message is very important. Oh yeah, absolutely. And I realized, and I, I'm setting it and up. You have by a good marriage. Yes, I do. And my wife's right here, wherever Melanie is. She <laughs> rocks. And everyone knows her because she was writing for the Jewish Times and editing and stuff. Like, I'm oh, usually so. her husband. Like, I'm the guy that's like standing next to her. Do you think she's she's happy to see you like this? Um, I don't know. Yell, are you happy? I don't know where they put her. Hello. Oh, there she is. Hi. Hi, Mel. There she's waving. Um, sing, sing, do you love me to him? No, it's okay. I sing that to her sometimes. Do I? What? So listen. So this is what I realized that. So there are that I've interviewed all these dads, and and I also talk about my own story. And most of us didn't have dads like Danny Tanner, right? Because right, and partly that's... I understand he's two dimensional, but also it just it wasn't what that era of fatherhood was like. And there are a lot of guys who didn't have dads at all, or who didn't have loving dads. Or, and, and I have had times in my actual life when, like Melanie will say, when our oldest child was born, and um, like, I guess he was like, what, nine, ten months? And she said, oh, I think he's teething. And I was like, oh, I remember when this happened with Michelle Tanner. And this is what, <laughs> like, she, Michelle needed extra TLC, so I picked him up and I'm holding him. And so I'm reading this book, right, and I'm realizing that you might not like this, but you might love it. Danny Tanner actually <laughs> is emblazoned in the minds of a generation of men as like the ultimate dads can be loving. Dads, like a great dad is a loving dad who puts his kids first. That's strength, that's male strength. And so and instead of, and, and so dads complain about some of this other stuff, like some, you know, what happened with portrayals of men, of fatherhood, and we can talk about that another time. But the point is, Danny Tanner is the ultimate awesome dad, and so there are ways in which, even as a real person, aspiring to be as awesome as Danny Tanner is genuinely affecting guys of my generation, because it's, he's in there. So I want to thank you, because your, your portrayal in this way is not two-dimensional. It's genuinely affecting. You know, I'm not saying it wouldn't happen otherwise, but I'm saying it's emblazoned in there. It is genuinely affecting and helping improve fatherhood for a lot of men out there, so thank you for that. Well, that's really sweet. I have three questions. One is, what size sweater do you wear? I don't, I don't like sweaters. Well, the other jacket, mm -hmm. tattoo of me on your shoulder, would you like? <laughs> the, the I'm glad you said shoulder. <laughs> yeah, that's, I, well, I start <laughs> yeah. there. Yeah, okay. Um, the the uh, truth of it is, as I've gotten older, uh, I really do, as, and it's not even a joke, I have three daughters that are 27, 24, and 21. Um, I consider myself to be Batman with them. And that is uh, a little bit more of a machismo way of being Danny Tanner. But I, the reason I wanted to play the character in the first place, I'm the one who told the producers, let's make him like Felix Unger, let's make him a neat freak. Yeah, you so that. now I'm all dust buster and got plastic gloves in a bucket, and I'm going, oh no, what have I done? Mm. 
And I'm the one that said he should hug a lot. I hug a lot. I brought hugging to my family. He should hug everybody. So people said, let's watch the hug fest tonight. So I did the two things. But if you compound those things and you got rubber gloves on and a bucket and you're cleaning all day long and you're dust busting all day long and you're hugging all day long, people may think that you live in a house in San Francisco with two guys because you figured out the miracle of life. Mm -hmm. But the thing that I'm most proud of is, and a lot of people do tell me that I, that I, you were the dad I didn't have. I was in prison and I didn't have a dad (laughs) and I'd like to know your address. (laughs) And I give it to them. Mm. And I have bunk beds put in. Nice just to make them comfortable. But the other thing is I have this Batman syndrome thing. I do have it. I, and uh, when my kids are having any problem, it's like you just, I'm always there and I'll take care of things in seconds. And, yeah. I, and I love it. Because so in real life, role, he has three daughters. It's a role like, that I, I love. Yeah. It's, and it's, I don't just do it with my kids. I do it with a lot of people and a lot of kids, friends of mine. I'm kind of like, it. I have a goddaughter I'm very close with. Mm-hmm. I have people that I, it's, it's nice to be able to not whine about it took me a lot of therapy to not be an idiot, which is to complain, oh, I've got to take care of this person and that person. It's like, hey, moron, you're yeah. lucky. You get to take care of people. Right. And it's not that hard a role. You just try to make time for yourself, too. So, and you're going to take care of me from now on, now that we've met. So I hear. Yeah, no, we, we got to think You're going to hold here. me like a small monkey. <laughs> I never held a small monkey. No. no. Well, we're going to wear a mic so everybody okay. can hear. So we'll be safe. Yeah, I was generally afraid that they were going to turn on our mics early when we were backstage. Right, um, if they did, you all, there, There's two mics in the room. You guys can line up with them now because this is going to be the last thing leading into audience Q&A. So um, you, after this era of, of Full House, America's Funniest Home Videos, you know. All and that's not even what the book is about. The book no, is right. more about everything. I yeah. guess the, that the book's about just two chapters of those things. Right. No, it's, it's mostly about what we've been talking about up until that. But the life yeah. stuff, and then yeah. the last third is a lot of different phases in my career, which right. would be stand-up, the aristocrats, weirdness, so. the entourage stuff, right. things. So that's what I want to go to now. So, so after uh, all that era, you, know, you end up doing the aristocrats, and which became famous in and of itself. I mean, even people didn't see the movie. Well, Everyone they should, knows they should that not you see it. If yeah. they, if they, it well, it, out of context, it right. shouldn't be seen. It shouldn't right. be Googled and looked at. But it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a piece of art about, yeah. about um, censorship is what the movie's about. That's right. what the joke is. Right. And but even the, you say it's, it's actually not meant to be funny. It's not, there's no punchline. I mean, right. it's a horrible, horrible joke. And George yeah. Carlin teed it up, the great late judge George Carlin, said this is not to be told around people. This is to be told we're in the back alley. It's just the two of us. And that's how Penn Jillette and Paul Provenza made that documentary. And it's not for everybody. No. Some people, the old pro- real problem with it is if people get the Aristocats, the Disney movie, <laughs> mixed up and put the wrong disc. <laughs> oh, God. You don't want to flop them being yeah. a good parent. Mm. Although, in reality, some par- like, at least one dad in the book made the mistake of thinking that his nine-year-old could watch your stand-up routine because yeah. it's Bob Saget. So it's a good thing you're out there telling people who you're... But, okay, so, but here's the question. So you also make fun of yourself on Entourage, playing this funny version of yourself. But I wonder if, like, you had this, this image as Danny Tanner and America's Funny Some Videos uh, uh, host. That's but so then, long ago now that I don't Right, but then did it, it flip but, totally, the 180. So, so then yeah, people now started I don't like thinking, that either, you're it, only the aristocrats guy, you're only the... Well, my the stand-up, contract. like my last stand-up special got nominated for a Grammy. Yeah. So that's right. like people know my stand-up, but Kathy Griffin won, but he's a good guy, so... <laughs> But my stand-up is also, I'm able to go do that, and that, yeah. that like, sells out, and that's, like, a whole different thing right. I'm trying to make. That's not, like, a whole big F-fest anymore, mm-hmm. either. I just did that when I did uh, one special on HBO called That Ain't Right. I don't know. I was just feeling very dirty that month. Um, I was just talking blue. It was like using F- um, Louis C.K. And, and Jerry Seinfeld talked about it on this thing that Ricky Gervais hosted about comedy. I was kind of using the F-word as a rim shot. It was like, it wasn't wasn't being used as a verb very much, but uh, there's also a 20-year-old audience. So I, that's not even what I'm doing now. Now I'm, I, I don't want to be either of those things. You want to be, as an artist, you want to go, well, I don't know what I am. I'm going to find out what I am. I'm not finding a, a brand and being that brand. Mm-hmm. Oh, look, I'm the dirty guy of bravado. That's like ridiculous. But, is that, but isn't that? That, is that why the book is now? I mean, isn't that maybe the, the bo- perfect reason? It's that the bipolarness that made the book have interest, I think. Yeah. And uh, I'm really honored that they, uh, I mean, it just went to paperback two days ago, 
And they, uh, Harper Collins has done a really nice job. Um, they made me look at least two months younger on the cover. That's the actual size of my head. <laughs> you pretty much look like that. Yeah. There's a picture on the back of me. That's my favorite. I know. Part. It's, it, where's the camera? It, can we get no. the close-up of this? I don't know. There's no cameras here, are there? There you go. Bob Saget, everyone. Bob. Josh, can we yes, go to the questions? Let's go to Q and A. Q and A. If you'd like to ask a question, please come line up behind me. I want to know why we sit reclining tonight. What? What? Actually, why, why is this night different from all other nights? <laughs> Let me just warn everyone, um, I, one of my jobs tonight uh, has been to, to make sure that we don't go n too far in a, a certain direction with the language. The wisest son asks. The wisest son. <laughs> yeah, and now the wicked son's going to come to the mic. So, so uh, stick within the realm of language when you ask your question that Bob has used tonight, okay? Don't, don't come up here and ask him to uh, recite or you recite anything beyond that, please. But questions are all welcome. <laughs> Bob. Yes, where are you? I'm right here in the center. Ah, cool. What advice would you give to a young father? A young father. Just uh, starting out. Well, starting out, use protection. <laughs> and then call me if it doesn't work. Um, I would probably give the same advice. I think we've, that's what you're concentrating on. Um, what I've learned is you you end up loving your kids so much. What, what you don't want to do is over direct it too much, your kid, cause, or give it that energy. I, if I had stuff to do over again, I think my ex and I both feel this way, that we would try not, try not to talk at our babies. It's very hard sometimes because they're so damn cute. But, oh, look at you, look at you. And then the kid's six, you're using words. And, you know, <laughs> to try to keep it in the realm of that they're just a deprogrammed person. And to not lose yourself in the kid, to keep love of yourself and, and really importantly, love of each other um, is one of the best things the kid can be modeled by. And then you gotta just make sure they don't get hurt. That's, that's, you really have to baby gate everything and you have to drive, drive them everywhere and love them a lot and drive them everywhere <laughs> until they're 40. <laughs> and, and even if you're not thinking about having a kid but you're in a relationship, the moment you get an erection, register the kid for schools. <laughs> Immediately. Or they, won't, or they won't get in. <laughs> and if they don't get in, you shouldn't go in. <laughs> that was okay. That was all right. All right. Thank you. <laughs> We can't see, so you all are going to have to tell us who's going to talk from which We mic. can't see. I don't know if there's any widescreens, and I don't know who I am anymore. <laughs> Hello? Hello. <laughs> we have a caller. There you go. <laughs> well, my kids both grew up with you in our house. Right. Um, full house. My kids can recite every episode backwards and forwards and then some. Right. Um, what do you consider a role model to be today? Um... Wave your hand so I can see you now. Oh, you're right, literally right there. <laughs> a role model today. You know, it's so interesting. There's so many. Sorry. There's so many different kinds of them. For, ki for little kids, you mean, or for everybody? Well, hopefully soon I'll be a grandma, so I want to know what I, what, who do you recommend or who do you think should, these kids should be watching today? You know, there's some shows that I kind of like that are not that hardcore, like Mike and Molly. That don't, uh, there, there are family shows that are on um, that you could watch together. Modern Family, the idea is to watch it as a family, but it still has a lot of suggestive stuff in it. But it shows that anybody can be together and it shows love, which is good. That's what I like at the core of those shows that have that little vibe. But there really isn't um, Everybody Loves Raymond kind of show. Um, I mean, I just finished watching Boardwalk Empire. <laughs> I don't really think that's to share with your kids. Although my daughters, my oldest daughter's like, did you see what happened? Like, don't tell me. But it's, but there's greatness in a lot of shows that aren't meant for kids 
when the character grows, when it's a really, really well-written show, the ones that you all love that we've, I mean, Breaking Bad was a great show, not for, not for a 12-year-old to sit and watch. Right. But, it, but the moral dilemma of humanity that comes up in some of these shows, I don't have little kids anymore, so I don't sit and watch The Big Bang. No, and neither I, do I. My kids are 20, almost 29 and 25. Well, I'll tell you one, it's pretty suggestive, but I really have always watched it. My daughters have always loved it. And it's South Park. And it's, and, it's, and it's a bluish show sometimes, but it's brilliant. And it does hold, it holds the culture up. And it does tell you not to be zombie-like and numb to life. So all of my kids have watched it, and ha it hasn't damaged them. They like it better than Family Guy. The Simpsons is a show you can watch with your whole family, but it, does, it didn't hit my kids as hard as South Park and Family Guy a little bit. Really, the stuff that they like is just like, also inane stuff. They would just watch, as kids, they would watch Spun SpongeBob SquarePants. And there's, there's a lot of shows like that now. You can find them on Adult Swim. And there's some pretty inane cartoon shows that are almost funny to watch. Oh, um, well, King of the Hill's not on anymore. Sorry, I keep going retro. I hope that answered. I didn't really have a good answer. Do you I'll just have? tell you, there's great stuff about that in the book, actually. I found it really insightful what you, what you were saying. Also, that's one of the reasons you like doing H.I.M. Uh, How I Met Your Mother, because you felt that it was, it was, it was beautiful. And, and you actually liked the ending, which was very complicated. I did, and there's another ending now, which is on the DVD. There's a whole new ending. No, there isn't. Yeah, there is. But there I, really is an alternate ending to that show? Yeah, and I, I narrate the whole thing. No, you don't. Yeah, I do. Is she alive? Is the mom alive? Can't say. Is the DVD out? I think it is, or it comes out right now. I'm going to target after this. Uh, All right, but, sorry, next but, question. Yeah, that's a sweet show, but it also had adult jokes in it, not unlike Friends, so it depends. But the kids aren't really, if you're concerned about your kid hearing, you know, jokes, they do do a lot of fluid removal kind of humor jokes on a lot of shows. But How I Met Your Mother, for the most part, is a love letter, so that was a nice show, I think. Good evening. Um, I have an admission, I don't think I've ever seen Full House, actually. <laughs> uh, but I have seen you on America's Home Videos and enjoyed that. But I wanted to ask you about the creative process of being a stand-up comedian, because it fascinates me. When you look at musicians, at least my impression is, most of them peak somewhere in their 20s, and then they do concerts the rest of their life where everyone says, play the stuff you wrote in your 20s. Right. But stand-up comedians, Jay Leno performs, what, 360 nights a year? I don't know how many nights a year you perform. Not as and, many. And, and, Jer and, and uh, Jerry Seinfeld basically is out there creating and continuing to create. How hard is it as you get older to be creative and funny in the same way that you were? I mean, are you, are you constantly creating new materials or are, are people who come to your shows on a regular basis say, do the bit you did in your 20s. Mm. So talk a little bit about the creative process. Yeah, well the way I work, I, I have to become new because I, mine is like, I, I don't know what I'm doing the first 20 minutes of, a, of an hour show. And I get a lot of stuff that I want to say, like hundreds of things, and then they come out in different ways. And then I'm, I'm working, I guess, the most like a Louis C.K. in that these are the things I want to talk about right now. These are the stories. And then there's some jokes that are solid jokes that I throw in kind of, I guess, in an old danger field kind of way that I just know are great jokes and I'll pepper them in. But I'm always thinking about a new, and Jerry's always thinking about a new, Chris Rock especially is thinking about a new stand-up special, as is Louis C.K. They're kind of the, the jewel in the crown of that mold of if they're gonna be doing another hour and 40 minutes set, they're gonna be filming that set at least a year later. So it takes minimum of two years to get a whole new hour up. And it takes, most people that I look at are four years in between getting a special. And the reason to record it on a special is a way of putting it to bed. And also you can sell it, so you own them now, because it's a different world than it used to be. And then you start over again, which forces you to be fresh. So I can't even do the comedy that I used to do or the jokes that I used to do because I was just a different person. I'm, I'm like a completely different person than I was seven years ago. So uh, not completely as a person, but I mean, in my stand-up, I've got some songs that people want to hear, but I'm working. It's very painful to write new stuff, but it's very necess necessary or you, you can't grow. Louis C.K. is amazing at it. A year, and he just, what, what you do to do it is you go up and do four sets on a weekend somewhere out in the middle of nowhere. 
and you do like an hour and a half a show, and then you come to the cities to do your tour. I just got off of a, I don't go out again doing stand-up till April, so, because I'm working on two projects, but I'm doing, I just did Iowa in a casino, the night after Borgata in Atlantic City, and the night after, uh, What's that wonderful island? Staten Island. <laughs> and it was really fun. But those were shows, so I wanted to really give them a, like a fun night. So I'd say for those people, about 35 minutes was new out of the hour and 15 that I did. Completely new. Did that answer anything? Bob, I've got a question for you here. Yes, sir. My dad was a stand-up comedian. What was his name? Henry Charles Jordan. And uh, this is before our time. I mean, it's before my time, so it'd be before you your time. You need to talk to the mic, sir. Before your time also. But uh, he was very good at what he did, but he didn't do enough. And the problem was that while I was going to college for years, he'd take me out to lunch about once every couple of weeks. And after the first several years, he told the same jokes. And it got kind of boring after a while. Right. So I skipped a couple of lunches in order to <laughs> prevent myself. And you know, you've got to self-defend yourself. And uh, he just had one big problem. I diagnosed it. It was he needed some writers. Now, in your particular programs that you do, do you have writers? And if you do, how much do they influence you? I don't have writers. I, I, if you looked at my iPhone, it has about, every year, about 5,000 things on it that I roll through, that I write all, I write all day long. So I'm writing stand-up all day long. And their concepts, some of them are ideas, some of them are stories, and so I, I get them out. So I just am one of those guys that does it all himself. I could be sued, I would be helped. I mean, again, to go back to Chris Rock and Louie, Chris has always sat in a room with five, six people, and I've done it with a couple people, bounced ideas off, and they've, we've done like a comedy exchange program. It's very, very, but I'm, I can't stand to be on the road, so I can't, I don't want to do, when they go on a tour, it's like, you know, coliseums and, not coliseums, but 10,000 seat venues. And I just, that's not, that doesn't get me three days in a row and I'm like a whining Jew in, that wants to go home from camp. <laughs> but I, and I don't know if I ever will want to do that, but I, there's a TV show that I'm working on a pilot for Fox that I have to have writers for. So, and that's a kind of a Groucho-esque kind of, show. It's a pilot, so it's a, that doesn't mean it's sold. It means we're shooting a pilot. And that definitely employs that. But in stand-up, I just wrote a new song, and I think it's the best song. I don't blame you again. <laughs> Same person came in and left out of anger that they came back. <laughs> Give you another shot. They tried once more, t once more time. Mm. He's a great writer. Once more Getting time, late. they come yeah. back. Yeah. But uh, I, 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 I write new stuff now that makes me happy enough to know that I'm creating still. I mean, creating more. I'm creating more now than I ever was able to because I didn't have the facility. Okay, we have one last question. Thank you. <clears throat> Bob, you were talking about how hugging is an important part of your life and it got you a lot of pain. Um, as a symbolic gesture of all the people here tonight, and uh, everyone who loves you, I'd like to be able to come up there and give you a hug for the whole entire JCC. <laughs> my question to you, is that okay? Well, but my, my question to you, does anybody know this man? <laughs> my wife will not admit it, Bob. I mean, I'll let you do that. You're not going to do nothing to me, right? You don't have... It will be a, it will be a hug from, from, from the heart. From the heart. So from you, the heart. You didn't take like a Viagra six minutes ago, did you? <laughs> Here, come over. Uh, I'll come down to you so we... Uh, Oh, meet them. It's got to be on the after you. Are you a doctor? I'm not. I won't squeeze you. Okay, we're hugging face to face, right? JCC. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thank What's you. What's your name? Greg Rock. Thank Pleasure you. to meet you. Thank you, Bob. Yeah. Thank you, Josh. Thank you. Thank Greg you. Rock. Thanks very much. He smells very good. Oh, does it smell very good? 
Thanks, Very everyone, for, for coming this evening. Bob's going to be signing you. his book. Buy it. Dirty awesome. Daddy in the theater. Give Josh a giant Download round of applause, please. Signing line Thanks, starts outside the gym. Bigger, a bigger round of applause. Check out our Thank cookies and coffee right Thank outside you. the door. Awesome. Thank we you for coming. I told you we know each other.